Is your job search stuck? Maybe you're not getting any interviews with employers, or maybe you are, but no job offers. Or you may be new and not even know where to start. This is Charles Maxwood, and I'm releasing a new course ebook on how to find a job as a software developer. The course walks you through the process of finding the types of companies you want to work for, getting their attention, and putting your best foot forward as the candidate they want. I've coached dozens of developers in looking for jobs and have been able to help several people find jobs within two weeks to two months. So whether you're new to development, can't find a great job that fits what you want, or looking for remote work from an area without a strong tech community, I can help. Go to getacoderjob.com and sign up today. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode, another great, great podcast of the Elixir Mix. Today on our panel, we have Mark Erickson. Hey, friends. Josh Adams. Oi. And this is my last week as a panelist on this show solely because I, I don't think that I'm as good. <laughs> I can't provide enough elixir value to the conversation. So in replacement of me, I'd like to introduce Nathan Hopkins. He's a, a good friend of mine. He has been involved in the uh, Ruby community and elixir community now for a very long time. And uh, welcome, Nathan. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm glad to be here. I'm the resident noob now, I guess. So uh, Elixir, Elixir is pretty new for me. Uh, I'm transitioning uh, from Ruby. I don't know that I'm leaving Ruby, but I'm definitely uh, starting to learn Elixir. And uh, so you guys will get to put up with my, uh, with my newbie questions. Awesome. And of course, our special guest today is Andrew Draiga. Andrew, how are you doing? Hi, guys. I'm fine. Thank you. How are you? I'm very good. So tell us a little bit about yourself and, and uh, why you are on the Elixir Mix show. Well, I've worked with like in Elixir for a few years, and I may be one of the earliest adopters in our country, in Ukraine. And I had, at the time, one of the largest open source projects. One of them was the National Cloud Service of Ukraine. If you follow uh, their GitHub, it's like huge. And it's currently implemented. It's governed like by law. Everybody in Ukraine started using it. And last time I visited my clinic, I actually used like a Elixir production system by just visiting the doctor. That's one of the reasons maybe. And second one is Sage. Should I tell more about it? Straight yeah, let's, let's definitely delve into Sage. Yeah. So doing all projects I did, I felt like I'm doing the same thing over and over again. So I, I like to build open source libraries and I have like a lot of them. Some of them was my mistakes, but some of them not. And one of the like often repeated parts was dealing with distributed transactions. But some, ta- some people and most of the people don't realize that that's distributed transaction. And the best use case, the best case where you can see them is when you have external billing system like Stripe. If you have Stripe, you basically have a distributed transaction because every time you create a subscription, you, can, you need to have at least some piece of data in your system and you still want to sync with Stripe and you want to guarantee some level of consistency because otherwise either some cl- clients would pay you and you won't provide them the service or it would be other ways. So you would provide the service and they won't pay you for it. I have totally run into this situation before. So that's why it's, it's going to be fun to talk about Sage and Sagas. So I look forward to hearing more about that. But I have run into this situation where just kind of what you outlined, right? That we have distributed systems, just whenever we, our system is dealing with anything that's external to us, anything like Stripe. I know I've worked with external uh, partners, partner uh, organizations. And so like the, the, one of the ways we approached this first was, all right, we're going to create a multi and we're going to say, okay, let's create a user register these different pieces in our system. And then we're going to go and talk to this external service. And then when that succeeds, then we'll record something, we'll send out an email, that that whole pattern. And then we ran into these situations where, oh, well, this request is taking too long, right? It's like over a 15 second request end to end, and our transaction is timing out. And so then it's rolling everything back. But then, wait, the the actual request to to the other system actually went through. So now we have this problem, right? Where we have database records that have been removed from our side, but something ended up happening in the external system. So yes, I, I think people are not aware that they have these distributed system problems as, I don't know, I think 
we have that more of a problem than we are aware of just because we're dealing with these external services. And I think Stripe is an excellent example of that. So, okay. So I started with my multi. That went badly. So yeah, what, yeah, what is... I, I actually do that even now. So I'm trying to like be very pragmatic. And when I implement some new Greenfield project, I'm trying to not bring all my stuff with me. Because otherwise, it's this looks weird. Like this guy jumped on the project and he added like ten dependencies he maintained. So that's a vendor lock, and I don't want to do that. So right now, I'm writing project with multi, mm -hmm. and it's doable when you know what you do, what you're doing. But it's, it's very hard when you deal with more than one system in multi. So if you deal with just one, it's it's simple enough because you have like a L statement that catches all possible conditions. But if you have more of them, uh, and I have that example somewhere in the Sage readme, it's very hard to write code that won't be error prone. Yes. So what is this idea of a saga? Am I saying it right? How would you describe that concept? Yeah, you know, I'm like Ukrainian guy, so I cannot spell it right. <laughs> <laughs> I call them sagas. Yeah, sagas. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's a paper... So you remember from 1984, I guess, pretty old one. It's about long grind transa transactions in uh, databases. And they solved other issue is when you want to run a long grind transaction and you can't lock your database during it runs. Because if, imagine you have like a reporting system in your bank and this report can take up to 24 hours to generate. And that's actually you real use cases from my past experience. And you cannot lock everything because somebody wants to use the your system. So they introduced Sagas, and Saga is a simple two-way pattern. So you split your transaction into multiple atomic steps, and for each of those steps, you provide a compensation function that should semantically compensate the effects. And by saying semantically, it means that there are some actions that you can just undo. For example, if you send an email, you cannot unsend it, but you can send an excuse email. And semantically, it means that you compensated the effect. So this, so basically, as I imagine it in my head, it's like a chain of functions. And if you fail in one of the stages, it just applies on the comp only compensations other way. Sage itself, it takes like one step further. So it allows you to do asynchronous stages. So it, at some point, you can run three stages asynchronously and then compensate all of them if one of them fails. But the pattern overall is very simple. And the best thing in it is not just code, is for me it's a new mental model. So it's it makes it much easier to think about those cases. It's much easier to test. It's just I don't know how to explain it. It's just it's a new mental model. It breaks you. Yeah, I love that because it is really just a new mental model. And it, it and that's what I love about like the the Sage library is it's really quite simple, and but it just helps give structure to that mental model, right? And so, like one of the things you mentioned there was that you have these I don't know we call them compensating or compensations. So, like the yeah. idea, if I, let's see if I got this right. So I say, okay, I'm going to take step one. I'm going to create a user or uh, create some entry in my system. Step two, I'm going to do another entry. Step three, I'm going to talk to an external system. And if that fails, it could fail for any number of reasons, right? Uh, maybe they, they reject uh, my request or I'm unable to connect to them for whatever reason. Then these compensating functions are saying, well, how do I roll it back in a, an atomic way? Like what is the undo for this? And it might be in some cases just a delete this record. It might be like in some cases where I've had a, like a general ledger where we can't delete entries, we might just create a new canceling entry, you know, so that still all balances. So that one might be the compensating effect for that one. And then in some cases, like the email one, it's like, well, I can't unsend the email that already went out. I can just say, hey, sorry, shouldn't have sent that. <laughs> but it, do I have that right? Like that is basically, it's that mental step or the mental model to say, I'm thinking about not just how do I perform this step that I'm wanting to do, but how do I undo it if something went wrong? Yeah, and also you need to think about all the steps all together. Because when you write it old-fashioned way, you need to, like you start writing the code and you try trying to think about all the edge cases. And with Saga's pattern or Sage, 
you can just think about each step separately. You just know how do they relate be between each other because you use effects created before your stage, but you don't need to like think through everything in, in the early beginning. Yeah, that's that's very compelling. Uh, speaking as someone who's done way too many, uh, I guess, best effort situations instead of bringing in sagas. Well, I, I think it's still okay to do best effort once in a while. Well, other patterns I used when I felt like I need sagas was uh, just using reliable views. I, I'm a big fan of rabbit and view. So I did it for a lot of times. And at, in one of the projects, we basically had like throwing message in the queue, reading it, throwing it back again. And it, it's, each time it's a new queue. So it was real, still reliable, but it's too complex. It's the most complex in operation because you need to manage new infrastructure dependency and it's just complex to debug. I won't do that second time. Andrew, you mentioned that uh, when you're when you start with a new team, you don't necessarily bring or on a new project, you don't bring Sage right off the bat. What's your strategy to allow that team to experience the pain or, or that particular project, even, even if it's your own personal project, how far do you go before you introduce Sage? Like, what does that workflow look like? I don't have like an, any formal flow for that. Uh, it's more about like, how do I feel about the code I write? Usually after you have two services, uh, like two external services in one call, it's time to use Sage because otherwise it's pretty complex. Even, uh, even one Stripe, uh, integration can be the case because with Stripe, sometimes you need to perform more than one action with one external system. Uh, in our case, uh, it was like you first you create subscription and then we update the customer meta metadata on Stripe and because we want to like set the ID of our system there and have links to CRM and from Stripe and from Stripe to CRM so that it's easier for customer success to navigate. That was also the case. Once you hit two external services is kind of the point that you should start looking at Sage or a solution similar to that? Yeah, I guess it's my rule of thumb. But it really depends. I guess you just need to use your best judgment as always. And I'm very ad hoc guy. So I know very structured engineers that like approach the problems in the right way. And I enjoy working with them, but I'm not like them. I'm, I'm very ad hoc. So I'm, I just use my best judgments, but that allows me to adjust the situation very, very fast. You spoke at, what was it? It was in Stockholm, right? Yeah. Presentation. Yeah. Codebeam, yeah. Codebeam in Stockholm. And you presented on Sage and, and Sagas. So yeah. I had a chance to look at that presentation, which I, I thought was really well done. We're going to put that in the show notes so others can find it. But I think that's a, a good resource for helping to build up your case for and kind of visually explaining these flows that you're talking about where you're going through these sequence of events and then something goes wrong. And from that point, you have a choice where you can how you try to re retry and recover or try and go back and start to roll back the, the changes. So how, what kind of reception have you had to your Sage library and kind of bringing it to the community? Have you gotten any good feedback? Oh yeah, I got a, a lot of good feedback, and um, I even feel very sorry that I don't uh, like fully extend it because I have a lot of plans and I know what can be there. Even there, some people was like talking to me and saying like this solves a lot of our problems. I know there there are companies that already actively use them, and a lot of people say that it simplifies like the structure of the application a lot. Great. Yeah, uh, but that would be like not maybe maybe in my best interest. But I think the video I was worrying too much there. <laughs> the the presentation the slides themselves should be very really helpful. Also, I have like a medium article that explains uh, the the same ideas as I told on stage. It can be also good material to learn. Great. I'll put that in the show notes too. Yeah, I thought yeah, the article was really good. Yeah, I can yeah, I can send you a link. Yeah. You said you had a lot of clients. Are you a consultant or are you working somewhere full-time? What's your relationship there? So I used to work full-time. So I had a team called Niba number 15. We did R&D projects for large companies. So one of the, for example, one of the companies was one of the biggest vintage funds in the world. 
Next one was eHealth, like National Health Service of Ukraine. And we did also like a few more projects, but large ones. And they, they all, like most of them was in Elixir. But right now I work full-time for a company called Hammer. And it's located in San Diego. And we help American dealerships to uh, sell cars via text messaging. So we publish the inventory in Facebook and other places and allow you to, and we see all the messages from the customers. And we also have like a call center that responds to all the text messages. We don't respond to calls, just text messages and try to sell car without dealership taking part of it. And we only send the lead when the guy is ready to buy car. I also do a lot of open source and most of it is not in like my private GitHub account. It's in Nibo number 15. And last time I checked, it was like more than 100 open source repos. It's a pretty good number. Yeah, it's pretty hard to maintain them. Yeah. I'm also trying to like participate in core team discussions. Like lately, I'm, I don't have a lot of time for that. And if I would find some time to work on something in open source, it would be Sage 100%. And one of the most, as I feel like most required feature there is to have a persistence adapter behind the Sage. Because right now, when you run the Sage, when it when the process that runs the Sage fails, you can't return from that state. So you just you just do the manual recovery, and I think it's it can be done much better way. So we can store state somewhere. So when when even the whole node goes restarted, you, we can like see that when the node reboots and keep compensating the effects. That's interesting. So what? How do you envision doing that? Like that you would be hooking up to, I don't know, configuring it to a repo or to something else? Kind of what did you have in mind? I don't think I, I would be able to solve like the distributed system problem of keeping state for all the uh, like use cases because it's it's very specific, specific to every environment and every project. So my plan was to build an adapter, like adapter behavior uh, and implement a simple one with something like disk log. There's Erlang application called disk log. Amnesia use it, use it behind the scenes. And it allows you to basically have a like, like write ahead log of everything happens, that happens in your system. So that can be a good start. And on top of that, I would rather see community to build what they want to use because it's it's very specific. That's cool. I haven't I haven't actually looked at disk log. I thought I'd read all the Erlang manuals. Yeah, I have that feeling every time. So every time I like I feel like I read all the manuals, I, I'm finding a new application there. And it's that's very cool that we have all that stuff like built in. Uh, yeah, I still want to find a good use for the uh, built in SSH server. Well, I can come up with a bad project for that. Yeah. Yeah, me too. I want a good one, not one I made up because I wanted to play. Well, I think you can do something with like something like in in browser SSH terminal with live view that should come up come out soon and Erlang's SSH model. So you would use all the modern toys all together. Yeah, I've and, done a I've I've a proxied a terminal to the browser on a Phoenix channel. It's pretty good already. I wanna do I think like a mud. Just you SSH in here, and now you have a process that you play in the mud. Anyway. Have you yeah. uh, looked at XVenture? Josh, have you done that? I have, I have looked at it a little bit. I haven't, haven't played with it fully. Also, a buddy of mine, uh, Aldrich, has a, a mud he works on. But yeah, it might be a fun little, little night project. To... Yes, there's a, another WX library uh, that's built into Erlang. At the Elixir Conf 2018, they talked about it and they kind of showed just kind of giving an overview of these are some of the things that are in the toolbox, right? That are available to us. And that one looked really interesting for me, just like, you know, it's kind of like how they build Observer and the debugger. It's all using WX widgets. And that was like, wow, there's looks like there's quite a bit more there than I thought. So yeah, I, I, built a, I built a Tetris client with it and uh, a few other things. It's pretty pretty great to just have out of the box. That's cool. <laughs> but now I'm interested in Scenic for anything I would have been using before. So, yeah, Scenic looks great. Uh, I haven't tried to use it yet, but I saw the talk about Scenic maybe a year ago, somewhere from Canada, and 
even back then it was looking great. Yeah, I played with it. It's really, really easy to work with. I don't know if you noticed, uh, Boyd had tweeted somebody made uh, essentially an Altered Beast animation sprite style uh, in Scenic, which looks fun. Anyway, yeah. I'm rambling. Yeah, I haven't seen that. I saw only uh, some tweet from the guy that made a keyboard like on the plane. So it should be fairly simple if you can do that on the plane. I know there's a lot of people who are going to use uh, Scenic, like the, the excuse to use Scenic by participating in SpawnFest. If you don't know, it's like an Erlang OTP, like ecosystem competition, and where you can have, like, I guess, 48 hours to write an app. And they have pretty cool board of like judges. So I expect a lot of people to use to try to use Incinic there. Yeah, I'm hoping I have an actual potentially justifiable production use case for it. So I'm hoping I'm hoping we go that route eventually. So do you build embedded systems? I work on a project that has distributed systems running a custom OS talking to us. And I could imagine part of the distribution being like Raspberry Pis connected to TVs doing interesting things. Well, guys, you, you build complex stuff. I just build web apps. Web apps are complex do. stuff. Yeah, they're complex. Yeah, if you, if you do them that way. So, Andrew, I was curious, like, what are some of the other kinds of uh, applications or systems where you found like sagas would be a good fit for? So, like, you, you mentioned Stripe, yeah. Stripe, yeah. And, like, because I, I can totally see that where, you know, you might have, I have to uh, make an authorization request and then do some business logic on my side and then capture the funds. It's like even where I'm dealing with just one service, I'm having multiple interactions with them. Well, you can use them even to structure your internal code. So you can make your domain context more separated from each other. You can do that with multi too. Uh, But multi is not the best fit if you don't want to use like Hector Repo at all. So you just want to run code. And with with sagas, like if you if you in the just don't use any libraries and just use sagas pattern, it can help you to have a better design of your system. Mm-hmm. In terms of like other places where where you can use them, everything that comes to in to my mind is always about remote system, like mainly about remote system. And uh, three most common use cases is billing systems like Stripe, CRMs like HubSpot, because it's like a lot of people don't really understand how important it is to have like an in-sync serum for your sales because they're never happy when, when it's out of sync. Uh, and analytic systems, because I'm trying to push all the companies I work for towards being more data-centric. And to do that, you need to have a reliable business intelligence, reliable analytics. So. If you lose something and you do it all the time and you don't notice that, it's, that would lead you to take wrong decisions and uh, lose a lot of money. Yeah, I even have an, like a, a local Ecto app or application has its own Ecto repo that I would prefer to be using Sagas to interact with because you can't really wrap it in the transaction with the other stuff. For you, Loot Crate is offering an opportunity to save 10% on any new subscription at lootcrate.com. Just enter the promo code BRIDGE10 for 10% savings. Loot Crate is one of my favorite things. Every month I get a box in the mail, costs less than $20, and it comes with all kinds of goodies. I have stuff from just looking at my shelf, Batman, Spider-Man, Ninja Turtles, Back to the Future, Lord of the Rings, Star Wars, and much, much more. So if you're a geek, a gamer, anything like that, and you want cool stuff to put around your office, uh, cool t-shirts comic books, etc., then definitely check out Loot Crate. To save 10% on your new subscription, go to lootcrate.com slash ruby. Again, that's lootcrate.com slash ruby to save 10% on any new subscription. Enter the promo code BRIDGE10 for 10% savings. Yeah, historically, I wrote Sage by trying to work on a new HTTP client. So it was like a very weird turn for me. But I started with... Speaking with Michal, uh, who is on the core team, and he did multi for Ecto. And I was speaking with him that I, I, I don't like most of HTTP clients you have in Elixir for various reasons. For example, we, we tend to use Hackney in every single project. 
but Cacne is known to be not very reliable when you use the pools. So we turn off the pool every time. And in current project, we have a lot of issues because of that. Because uh, mm -hmm. because of we don't use pools, we very fre frequently uh, reach limit of open sockets host machine. And that causes, causes us a lot of issues. And Michal shared with me his ideas how to build like Saga-like HTTP client. And then he told that there is somebody on the core team already working on HTTP client, so you should give up. And I did. But the idea of Sagas, like in, in their pure state without HTTP client, was like kept. And after that, I took maybe two months to think about the idea. And then I used to implement billing system for a new project. And after I did that, I was like, okay, now I'm really doing this. What I think is interesting about Sagas is like one of the ways I solved this problem in a different way, which, which was more complex. It's not wrong. It's just a different solution. I just wanted to mention this so we can kind of discuss the, the pros and cons. But uh, it was the idea of having, like in this case, I had an umbrella application. And I had one of the applications that its job was to talk to and be my interface to that external service. So in, in our case, it was a bank. It could be like a payment application that knows how to talk to Stripe and possibly other you know, abstracts away that I'm talking to other payment gateways as well. And then the idea was, I would say, well, I'm going to make my request to this app and it's going to track that I've made this request. It's going to return immediately. And it's just going to say, yes, the request is formatted validly. I'm taking on the ownership of this and I'll let you... Then the rest of the flow and the main application continues and it becomes asynchronous. And then it goes off to a worker and talks to like the bank or Stripe. And then when it has errors, it says, oh, well, I'm going to try and you know, depending on the type of errors, like I might retry it because there might be outages or whatever. But then you still have that problem of, well, eventually it totally fails because maybe something about the account wasn't set up properly. So we had the ability to kind of go back in and say, okay, well, now we've talked to the bank. We've had manual intervention. We've you know, fixed whatever's going on with this person's account. And now we can rerun this and it will continue and pick up. But it's still... So what I like about Sage and, and Sagas is it, it says, well, I don't have to go all the way to that level of kind of uh, breaking out the system, having proxies for different services, because that might not be appropriate, right? There's plenty of applications where I have, it's like where I just need to talk to HubSpot or to Salesforce or something. And I just need to kind of have a, where it's a reliable system where it can recover when something goes wrong but uh, I don't know. In, so in, in some cases, I think it might be over-engineered depending on the application to go with the approach that I was suggesting. But uh, I don't know. So I don't, what are your thoughts? Well, we engineers tend to over-engineer. That's okay. Well, in your particular example, I, I would not use Saga there. I would just use something like RabbitMQ because it gives you the queue itself and then you have a dead letter queue. So you can... Uh, give the message in, in the queue some amount of retries and then it would be dropped to the letter queue and there you can have a separate worker that just applies the recovery. So in terms of mental model, it's the same. I would use RabbitMQ just because it has like a nice UI, it better fit for a long running. Like if you, if you have a message in the queue for a while, that's a better fit. Uh, because with sagas, uh, you can lose lose them depending on what implementation do you use and does it precede the state. Nice. Yeah, I haven't had the opportunity to play with Rabbit yet. You've mentioned that you like that. Uh, have you ever, I don't know, like there's some, uh, I can't remember what it's called right now, the one that's built into uh, AWS that's a Kafka-like. It's uh, SQS, Simple yeah. Queue Service, I guess. There's Simple Queue and there's another one too. But uh, anyway... Uh, I'm just curious, like, I know Rabbit is built in Erlang. And so it, that might integrate really well with the Beam. But what's that like for you in working with Rabbit as a system? Oh, well, that, that's pretty painful because right, even today, I was writing a new client for Rabbit. The main pain point is that all the, like, official, no, not official, like half official Excel client, uh, it's called MQP. They use common library from the Rabbit MQ itself. Just because, like, guys, they're written in the Erlang, so we can reuse the components. 
but that library you, has like a lot of dependencies and very weird ones because it's Erlang world and they use Logger. And as soon as you try to use MQP, it, it just messes up your system. So it, it has Logger, Recon, Ranch, but not the most, like the new one, but older one. And you can, can have conflicts with uh, Cowboy and all that stuff. And I feel like community miss a good adapter for everything here. Interesting. I, yeah, I hadn't gotten that far to, to discover that pain point. So my, thanks for saving, my, saving me some trouble. My first Elixir application had uh, AMQ, AMQP queues behind it, and it was uh, it was it was awful. That was easily the the worst part, just figuring out how I wanted to do that. Everything else kind of went fast. Anyway, so I, I feel those pains. Yeah, I totally agree. It's more about developer experience. I, I'm not sure why they they never notice it, like why they don't, don't care about the community. But that's the case. I, I by myself, I wrote like four clients. It's uh, it was all, they all was, were built on top of MQP. But it's like generation or generation they were, were improving. And the last one I wrote, uh, the previous company I worked for, uh, it works like reliably reliably for more than a year. And uh, I asked the guys that maintain it right now, like is it like is it works reliably? And they said like over a year we never touch the code. It just works. So, and I have some ideas how to further improve it. And I plan to open source that when I'm done. Awesome. So the other service I was thinking of is Kinesis. Oh no, I haven't, haven't used it, never. No. That's fine. We did use SimQ service though. Mm -hmm. What was that like? Well, it was used in very edge case. Um, so we have like, we receive a lot of web hooks. And when we run migrations to database, or you just we just have a downtown downtime. Uh, we can't miss those webhooks because those webhooks are messages from real customers, and if we lose them, nobody is happy. So we have like edge services that use SQS to like they try to proxy call to the to the backend instantly, but when the call fails, they queue the request and retry it later. But that was very simple in this case. That's actually a problem that uh, we're having currently at work. It's just some some older legacy code. It's Elixir, but it's you know as amazing as that is, right? Elixir is young, but now I have legacy code. It's these little workers, and they yeah supposed to be sending webhooks, and it was that same exact problem. And these other external partners were not getting their webhooks. And that's not cool because like that messes up their business process. So we have to go through this whole process to figure out, well, how can we resend those out after we fix some of the data problems? So yeah, that's that's a good idea. SQS could be a good fit for that. Yeah, any queue, basically. It doesn't matter what, what kind of feed you pick. You just, just need to feed your uh, like persistence guarantees. Webitin queue has few things that it's very hard to implement. One of them is delayed delivery. So to if you want actually if you have a message but you can you want to retry later, it's not that easy to do that. Yeah, so like a small cheat is to create a second queue and to have it a dead letter queue for you, your queue and have a message expiration time there. So you basically like reject the message, it goes to that queue and that queue it also expires and returns returns back to you. But that's not super easy. About that problem with webhooks, I even thinking to build something in open source because that's very I see that very common problem. A lot of services receive webhooks, and it's not just uh, reliable delivery. It's also important to, for you to see all the incoming webhooks and try to debug them. So you, at least you need to know all the HTTP status codes you receive because it's sometimes hard to debug, and sometimes you want to repeat them just manually. So you found a bug, you go to some Docker container that you installed and has a UI in, within Elixir, and you log into UI and just click repeat and repeat all the failed hoops. That would be pretty cool. And that about legacy, cool. yeah. And about legacy code, you, I, I do trust that there is legacy code. And <laughs> the company I worked for, I guess it was one of the very early adopters. So we have one of the services, it's written when we had no ecto okay. so it has it has handled orm and 
if it's just one test, that's the one that you generate with Smith project. Nice. The test. Yes. Yeah, one plus one. Is two. <laughs> so I know about legacy code. We have a lot of it. Yeah. And, and that's the tough thing, right? Because like when you... And Nathan, you can speak to this too. Like when you're coming new to a language, be it any language, like if I'm starting to play with React uh, JS for the first time, the first stuff I'm going to build is going to be pretty crappy. And, and that's going to be my legacy code, especially if I pro- go to production with it at all. Like Nathan, what's, it, what's this uh, path been like for you? Well, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I'm pretty... I'm, I'm very early days. But uh, yeah, yesterday I had a... a a set of code I was, I was creating just to try to get something to function. And it was exceptionally ugly, but I was okay with that because I was just trying to shoehorn a solution, right? And I got it to function. And then I realized there was a much better way to accomplish the thing. And I backed out of every, all of it, right? So. Yep. And that's, that's okay, right? We, we have to be okay with that. And I don't know, I've been there, right? It's, it's the, uh, I'm just trying to make it work. Like, you know, I came from Ruby, right? And when you're comfortable with Ruby and you're doing TDD and you got all your tests written first, like, but when you come to Elixir and you're fresh, you're like, I don't, I don't even know how to do that. I don't even know what my code is supposed to look like. Like, you know, so it's, you're, you're in, in that, that awkward position. Yeah, I've got a buddy in that position right now about to start his, his first real Elixir project. And he was like, man, I don't even know where to put stuff. Yep. Yeah, it's because I think Elixir is a bit different. So it takes time to break your head. So you can, you should actually change the way how you think about the code. I remember my feeling when I first started. So first two days, I felt like like this thing is not pretty good. It's like, I don't understand it. Maybe it's too complex for developers who would ever use it. And the next few days, I was thinking that, that now it's I'm dumb and the language do it. And after I got the basic uh, concepts, it's uh, it made me feel like I'm super efficient. And even now, I think I might be 10 times more efficient in Elixir than in any other language I used in the past. Yeah. Um, what, mainly what, uh, because, yeah. I'm just curious what languages you've had experience with. Like, what did you come from most recently to Elixir? So the longest experience was with PHP. I started doing commercial projects when I was 13. So it's more than 10 years. Wow, uh, when you're 13, nice. And you're yeah, I did. <laughs> yeah, I, I did websites for my neighborhood. Uh, <laughs> for, the, for Actually, for their company. So I had friends with companies and they that build websites for them. One company would try to hire me and I even passed the phone interview. And in the end, it was like, so this is a position where you need to relocate to Israel from Ukraine. And I was like, okay. And they they like, how old are you? And I'm like, 14. And they said, no, sorry, you cannot relocate to you. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> uh, other than it was, um, I did some amount of JavaScript because before we decided to move to Elixir, uh, we, we evaluated JavaScript because it's just so easy to hire people on the market. We took a look at Go, but we didn't build anything for production in Go. I, I don't know, it just, I just didn't get the Go. And I felt like JavaScript like a system was broken. So when you, I don't want to spend more time looking up for libraries than writing code. In Elixir, I feel like I don't need any libraries. And some people hate me for that. But I, I actually think I can implement pretty much any small library uh, within a few days, and it would just work for me. I, I favor that side too, where it's it's really isn't that hard to build a lot of solutions just in you know, what we have with Elixir and Erlang, and just kind of what's already in the box. I, I totally understand that, and I don't like to bring in all these libraries that I don't know people are kind of creating, which. I don't want to fault anyone for creating them, right? I think that's great that the community is creating these things because they do solve needs and they help people. Uh, but it's, it's, at the same time, it's like I've been burned by Rails and JavaScript where you bring in all these libraries and then the upgrade path just gets really nasty. And they, they go out of maintenance and now I have to refactor all my code. And well, I didn't actually need it anyway. I could have just solved it more natively. So yeah, I, I agree with that. Yeah, and even in Elixir, you can uh, sometimes when you look up the packages on Hex, you can find packages that 
are not maintained anymore. So the language is very new, but there is already that package there. And even the ones that are widely used, I tend to look at source code of every package I use because I'm very curious how, how it's built. And if there's like just few lines of code, why, why should I just use, like I can copy paste it. I don't need to use the dependency. Exactly. Yeah. It's like, what is the magic little thing that they did? Oh, they're calling this Erlang library with like this. Like, oh, that's all I needed. It's like this two lines. Yeah, exactly like that. So if I see it's built wrong by my opinion, I'm, I'm not always right. I, I often wrong, but when I feel it's, it's built the wrong way, I'm trying not to use it. Speaking that's an interesting... Of, go ahead. I, I was going to say it's an interesting dynamic. Um, you guys talking about the dependencies. Given that you looked at Golang before, they don't really have a, a package manager story on a good one yet anyway. And uh, I think they're making some progress on that front. But uh, I mean, Hex and the, the package manager for Elixir is a first-class citizen from early days, right? Yeah, I guess from pretty early ones. I, I wasn't there before Elixir, Elixir maybe one to one. But when I started working in Elixir, it was already there. Yeah, Hex, Hex has been around for a long time. Yeah, and I, I think it's a good thing. Um, I still feel that we miss some very core components uh, on Hex. So either underdeveloped or they just don't exist yet. Maybe they exist somewhere in the code base of some closed project, but not in open source. Which thing to... specifically? To name few is, so we have a lot, a lot of ways to run the ground jobs, uh, but they're, like I don't see any like widespread ones. So the fact that there's a lot of like used ones, but not the, the, there's no like a winner in that area. Uh, because there is nobody who would just contribute a lot of time designing the adapters and covering more use cases. That's why I, I particularly build my RabbitMQ adapter and background system by myself. The QS clients, that's other one that I feel need. I like uh, what guys doing in FireNest for distributed systems. So we have like a Phoenix that is very nice for web apps. Uh, we have Elixir and they like OTP. Uh, they have a lot of stuff that can make you a super efficient developer. Uh, and when you want to take next step, in something like Pyronist. What else? It's, it's, it's very hard to, you know, when somebody asks you, it's, it's hard to tell. Oh, yeah, HTTP, HTTP client. We totally need one. I know there is a project called XHTTP. I can send a link. Currently, it doesn't have pools and few other features. And after that, I guess it, it will be done. And uh, I heard that maybe it would be merged with Elixir itself because Elixir needs to do some HTTP calls. Yeah, I think part of the uh, the keynote this year was that it's not it's not going to be merged as as part of the core. I felt like it's uh, they don't promise to have it merged. Yeah, yeah, maybe maybe they didn't promise not to. Maybe I don't know, but I, I would like to see a good HTTP client there, and and the reliable one. I know that. Core team is very busy right now with Hector 3.0 and the new project, uh, we use it already. So we're trying to be a master because it's Winfield project and we don't want to end up in a situation where we have let it, like old code base in two weeks after we run the project. <laughs> and it's, it's very stable. I must say it's, I never had an issue. So I, I found few issues there by being on master branch, but they were to use it much before now. So it, it's not Hector 3.0, it's just something that wasn't there before. I really like the way it, it's looking, but I haven't used 3 yet. Well, it's hard to tell how it would look because they didn't split the Hector in Hector SQL and Hector itself. So it didn't happen yet. It, it happened in the code base. So the, the adapter is split in three pieces. But how, like, what parts would be moved away and what be, would be the public interface, we don't know yet. And I want to know among first because I have an adapter for Amnesia and I'm trying to decide what should I do with it. Should I maintain it or drop it? Because writing adapters for Icto is not very easy. And it's easier for SQL databases because there's a lot of infrastructure that is done. But it's not very easy when you do something else like you know, object storage. Yeah, I was just looking at the new Ecto master page where they had the README and they're talking about like 
the Amnesia Ecto adapter and is it 3.0 compatible? I have a little table here and no, it's not. I didn't know, I didn't even know there was an Ecto Amnesia. That's cool. Yeah, I built it for a special use case. Uh, we actually, like the pro- project we built it for, it was uh, frozen before release. So we never used it. Uh, but the plan was that we can start with the Ecto and Postgres adapter. And we had a matching en- engine. So if you did, if you uh, even participate in like trading systems, like, I don't know, bought a Bitcoin, you know, there's like, sell and buy offers so we try to build a matching engine in Asia. nice i can see the yeah. conflict there of how do you want to maintain it i don't know yeah that's especially when you've got your like 100 or so uh repos <laughs> yeah uh there's a lot of other ones that deserve a lot of love and i really want to spend more time with them but Nisia is uh, i i think it's it's a good for the community to have Nisia adapter because I, in future, I would like to see Ecto to like to be drop, drop in, uh, like so to come with some drop in replacement for database. So if you're just a beginner and you just want to write your to do app, why do you need to install Postgres if you if you're not, not doing any complex stuff? So I, I think Manisia can be a good one for that. Nice, yeah. So, uh, Andrew, we're we're wrapping up on the time. Is there anything else that you'd like to discuss while we while we still have you? I'm not sure. We covered a lot of ground, didn't we? We did cover a lot yeah. of ground. Yeah. If if the uh, the listeners can't see, but there are tons of notes in our chat for this conversation. So, uh, we're going to go ahead and move to picks. Do you run your own freelance business, or maybe you're thinking about picking up some business on the side? Well, then you need FreshBooks. FreshBooks is the quickest and easiest way to get invoices out to your clients. It's easy to use. It works anywhere, available from any device, uh, on the desktop, iPhone, iPad, Android, and all of your data is backed up and secure. And it makes it really easy to get organized and get paid. You'll be tracking time, logging expenses, and invoicing your clients in no time. You can also save time billing, freeing up several days per month to focus on the work that you love, and you get paid faster. FreshBooks customers are paid on average five days faster because there's a link on the invoice that says pay me now. And it's a great way to grow your business. Plus, FreshBooks is offering a 30-day trial. That's right, 30-day trial if you try them out. So go to gofreshbooks.com slash devchat and enter devchat in the how did you hear about us section. Once again, for a 30-day trial, go to gofreshbooks.com slash devchat and enter dev chat in the how did you hear about us section. We'll start off, if you're ready, Mark, we'll start off with you. Sure. So there is a, uh, a game on Steam called Mark of the Ninja. And they recently are releasing a remastered version. And so it, that's where it kind of came up on my radar again. I had the game already, and it is a stealth-oriented game. You're trying to like sneak and everything. And it's, it's really fun. So I pulled it out again just because it, the, like, oh, the news about the remastered version coming just kind of like, I'm just going to pull it up again. It's like, oh yeah, I really enjoy this game. This is really fun. So because it's coming up again, I was just going to let people know about it. It's uh, Mark of the Ninja. It's a 2D side scroller, but it's stealth oriented. And I, I really enjoy it. Awesome. Uh, Josh, you got some picks? I do. Uh, and we've already talked about it, which is the blog post for a sneak peek at Ecto 3.0. It's really good to see see what's coming down the pipe. And that's all I've got. Awesome. Uh, Nate. Sure. Uh, since um, I'm new to uh, Elixir and the Phoenix world, I've, I've started a course with Pragmatic Studio. It's their programming Elixir course. Um, it's been fantastic, uh, fantastic resource for me. The pacing of teaching is really good, uh, reinforcing concepts. And they basically start you out with an empty mix project and have you build a very lightweight variant of what Phoenix is from the routing layer into your controllers and your views and templates and all that sort of thing. So it kind of gives you a little deeper understanding of the Phoenix framework. And that's been working really well for me. Awesome, I'll, I'll go ahead and share next. You know, I, I've often shared these these two picks that I have on multiple occasions on both of the podcasts that I'm on. and. And I just want to share them finally because they are the most important ones that have affected my 
my business, which is Code Fund. And I should say that Code Fund, we are looking for Elixir developers, not Elixir developers to hire, but we're looking for Elixir projects that we can support. We are an ethical ad platform. And we'd love to help you continue to do what you love to do, which is code and not have to worry about the money behind it. Um, as far as the picks goes, I'd like to first pick Metabase, uh, metabase.com. And CodeFund uses Metabase pretty heavily for its dashboarding, but it is an amazing free tool. It's completely open source, amazing free tool that allows you to be able to bolt on this insanely awesome UI and dashboarding toolkit on top of your Postgres databases. It also supports different databases as well. Uh, kudos to all of those who are working on Metabase who are... Uh, who have put in their time and talents and efforts into making that such an amazing project. So thank you. And then finally, uh, my, other, uh, my other pick is Polymail. Now, Polymail is an interesting email application, and they, they have some glitches, um, but, but I'm telling you, stick, stick with it. Now, if you run a business or, or email is a huge part of your life, I highly recommend Polymail. They have all sorts of features that that really enable a single person to um, perform tasks that should require a team. And that's because of their, their organization, their scheduling system. They have a built-in cal- Calendly-esque calendar. They have drip campaigns, regular campaigns. You can mark emails as respond later. You can delay email sending. You got your read receipts. It just has so many features. It's unbelievable. It is a paid email service, but it's worth it completely. So I I recommend polymail.io. And that's all I have. So Andrew, finally, over to you. What are your picks? Well, I have one non-technical. So Lately, I started to listen to a podcast called Tide of History. And I never was a historian guy. And I felt like it's a huge gap in my knowledge. So it helps a lot to cover the gap. And maybe a technical one is uh, there is an, an airline project called Eternity. they about blockchain. But what makes it interesting is that uh, they have so... Uh, much experience of airline developers on board like almost all the cool guys are there and i'm trying to follow their github repos and see uh, what approaches do they take so it's a, it's a good way to grasp like to get your inspiration from that's great and if people want to find you on the internet or how can they how can they find you how can they get a hold of you well i have uh, the same nickname everywhere it's andrew Riga. And uh, I guess we can put uh, like my website in, in sh- show notes. And it has all the links on all the social media, all the websites, Medium. So it would be very easy to find me. I'm also on Elixir Slack, as Andrew Riga. I'm on Elixir IRC. Uh, and even feel free to mail me. Awesome. Awesome. And finally, I'd like to give thanks out to our sponsors. Uh, I know that when you listen to these podcasts, you hear the sponsors and you can tend to tune out, but understand that they are the reason we're able to do this. So if you can check them out, that would be wonderful. They provide awesome services for all of us as developers. So, and that's it. We will see you next week. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com to learn more.